welcome Gillian Russell, uh, who's the Director, Health Workforce at the Scottish Government. And may I begin by inviting Ms Russell to take the solemn affirmation. Please raise your right hand and repeat after me. I solemnly, sincerely and truly declare and affirm. To solemnly, sincerely and truly swear and affirm. That I will tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. That I will tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Thank you. And I would now invite you, Ms Russell, to make a brief opening statement. Thank you, convener. This opening statement is to give some, co some background to my career as a civil servant and the context to my role as confidential sounding board. I have worked in Scottish Government since 1992. The first part of my career I worked as a lawyer, being promoted to senior civil service in 2007 and then moving into policy roles in the justice portfolio in 2010. I was appointed as Permanent Director of Safer Communities in December 2015 with the Safety, Security and Resilience Brief, including the Police and Fire Service. On 17th March 2020, I moved to my current role as Director of Health Workforce, working on the COVID response. Turning back to autumn 2017, the SG, like other organisations, was reflecting on the issues raised by the Me Too movement, with extensive media reports and focus on sexual harassment in the workplace. By end October, early November 2017, there was both an SG and UK civil service-wide expectation of an effective response, including the creation of a safe channel for staff. It is documented that our organisation was picking up concerns from staff following the all staff message on 2nd November and PermSec blog on 6th November. On 10th November, the PermSec asked me to take on a corporate role in relation to sexual harassment. The role was communicated to the Scottish Government through an all staff message on 13th November. In that note, the PermSec advised that I was to act as a confidential sounding board for those that had experienced sexual harassment, whether current or in the past. It was made clear that this was not to supplant existing arrangements, but to provide another option for those who would like a private, informal and supportive space. I was very mindful that the people that might come to speak to me might be fearful in taking the step to speak to a senior official. In response, it would be important to develop a relationship of trust and confidence, in particular that they could speak to me in complete confidence. It was important to understand what mattered to the individual and support them. I considered it important that any issues raised with me were taken seriously and dealt with promptly. I anticipated that the things they shared with me could be distressing. This is a role that I have continued to do. My details remain on the internal SG staff pages. It was in this role that I was approached by an individual for support that became Miss A. I met with her, took a note of that meeting and passed that note to HR anonymously on her behalf on 22nd November. On 29th November, I engaged with Miss A on behalf of HR to ask her to speak to HR direct. She agreed. I had no further involvement in the steps that followed in relation to the engagement that then took place with HR. I am not giving evidence to this committee on, on, on my own behalf, but on behalf of ministers. This is complex legal territory and I am privy to information that may have been subject to legal proceedings to which confidentiality is claimed by other parties or goes to the heart of the integrity of the role I was given. I will try to answer questions to the best as I can, but may need to pause for legal advice or follow-up questions in writing with detail to ensure accuracy and to ensure that all the government's legal duties are fulfilled. In line with the approach of other attendees, I declare that I am a member of the FDA union. Thanks, Convener. Uh, thank you very much, Ms Russell. Can I just ask you a, a quick question um, before we move on? We, we heard um, from Barbara Allison about her role in pastoral care. And I just wonder if you could clarify me the different, for me the difference between your role as confidant and the pastoral care role that was undertaken by Ms Allison. 
Yeah, so um, the role that I was asked to do by the um, Permanent Secretary was around the, um, the confidential um, space, the, the, the conduit, as she, she described it um, to me. She said that she was looking for someone that staff could approach and that had experience of um, dealing with sensitive issues. So, um, I, to, to be honest, at the time in, in November, and the documentation will demonstrate this, I wasn't aware of Barbara Allison having had that role of pastoral care. What I was aware of was the role that the, the Permanent Secretary asked me to do. And I think the origin of it can be traced back to the letter that she'd received from Sir Jeremy Haywood at the time, which had asked for a safe, um, a, 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 a person that could, could provide that, that safe role within, um, within the UK civil service. So, so that was her answer to that. So is it a case of people going to you direct rather than being referred to you? Yeah, so the, 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 I think it was important to recognise that the role that I had was there if staff wanted to take up that option. So um, I, the role was um, promoted um, to the civil service in an all-staff message on the 13th of November, and the, the committee will have seen um, that all-staff message, and that staff message did make clear to staff the basis on which they could come and speak to me, and, as it's, and, I, and it's as I set out in my introduction. So that was a very clear message to staff around that. And on that message going out to staff, I, I simply waited to see if anyone did want to approach me that wanted to raise any matters with me in relation to sexual harassment, either current or historic. And um, so, so obviously, um, I, I waited to see whether anyone would, would take up um, the offer that had been made to them as, a, of a senior civil servant um, in that space. Thank you for the clarification. Can I move, please, first of all, to Margaret Mitchell? Uh, thank you, convener, and uh, it still is morning. Good morning, Ms. Russell. Um, just to clarify um, what you said to the convener there, um, can I be clear then there was no interaction between you and Barbara Adamson in her role as pastoral care officer and yours as the yeah. confidant? Yeah, so um, it would be helpful just to articulate that a little bit further. So um, after I took on the role on the 13th of um, November, um, there was um, an engagement with Barbara Allison, and Barbara Allison advised me that there might be somebody who might want to come and speak to me. I advised Barbara that, um, as, um, as had been set out to the organisation, I could be contacted. There was a text number made available to staff for that purpose. And that if anyone wanted to contact me, obviously I'd be very happy to, to see what I could do to support them um, as had been set out in that note. So um, the person um, then did get in touch with me and that became Missy. This, she knew someone um, wanted to, to talk, talk she to you? She just said to me that there was somebody that might want to speak to me and um, she passed on... Um, She's, and I said, well, if there's someone that wants to speak to me, please can they do that through that text number? And I can obviously speak to them and see what they would like to do next. And that's how, th how that started. And she didn't give you any context about how she knew about this person? She would have said that they, she'd been approached by somebody that wanted to speak. Uh -huh. yeah. and, and that was all I knew, okay. yeah. Can I ask, did anyone who came forward to you to raise concerns about historic sexual harassment indicate to you that they had raised these incidents with anyone at the actual time the incidents took place? Um, I'm not sure I'm allowed to go into that level of detail. It's a general question, you know, had they raised it with anyone at the time? No specifics. I'm just, I'm just being careful because of the risk around jigsaw identification. It's not that I'm trying to be unhelpful to you as um, Deputy Convener. Um, uh, if I'm asked truthfully, yes, they had. Right, that, that's helpful. And um, you're not able to say, or are you able to say who they traced it? For example, we know from the FDA um, evidence there were a lot of people had raised concerns but not formal complaints. We know a lot of them um, sometimes raised them with their line yeah. manager. 
were they able to say, if not a person, you know, genuinely as sort of I'm just host. being careful again about yeah. the constraints yeah. that I'm under. Um, just, just in general terms, had been raised within their own internal line management. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And are you able to confirm or not if Barbara Allison uh, was informed about them at the time? I have no knowledge of that at all. As far as, as, far as I'm, I, I recollect, um, it was their internal line management arrangement that had been fully advised. Okay, thank you. Um, could you confirm how long your role as confidant to the complainer lasted? For example, once complaints passed to HR and were formalised, did your role cease or did you continue to provide support yeah. throughout? Yeah, and is that including up to the judicial and beyond uh, the judicial so, review? So um, I know that unfortunately you haven't had the documents, but I think the document in my last email to Miss A made clear that I would continue to offer support for her if she wanted that. And um, I have seen the further documents, which I didn't see at the time, but I've seen them in, in, in the subsequent um, documents that are being produced to the committee, advising Miss A that I would be available to provide support to her if she wanted it. I can confirm to you that she didn't take up that offer of further support during that process, but obviously um, if she'd asked for further support, of course I would have given that. Okay. Um, you, you were obviously then in contact with the um, complainants during the judicial review period or you know you had the ability to be. Were you aware of the offer of arbitration having been made by the former First Minister? So, so, so just to be clear, I wasn't, um, I wasn't involved with the complainants during the judicial review process and in fact I didn't have any engagement with the judicial review process prior to being asked to attend a court in the Commission. I understand that, but I believe then the offer of um, arbitration came way before the, uh, the judicial proposal. Uh, you weren't aware of the so, offer so, of so arbitration so being made the at all? the 29th of November, I, I didn't have any knowledge other than I think I would have been advised that there were formal complaints going forward, but uh, the nature of what happened in that process, there was no reason for me to, to be told anything about that. The, 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 there was no basis for me to, to, to be involved in any of that at all, so I had no knowledge, just, just to be clear on right. that. So you had no knowledge um, at all that an offer of arbitration had been made. When did you become aware? I mean, we're all aware of it now. When did you become aware? Only when... These papers, I wasn't aware of, of, of that until these papers came were presented. That, yeah. That's helpful, okay. thank you. Um, without going into the specifics about individuals, um, can you say generally, um, from those who contacted you, did they have a clear outcome in mind? Were they clear they wanted to make a complaint or did they just wish to speak to someone? So, um, I suppose in terms of the role that I took, bearing in mind that I have a confidence the people that spoke to me, people came and spoke to me about current and historic issues, and each of those was unique and required its own set of discussions. So really my role was to, to see what the individual wanted, to listen to what their concerns was, and to consider with them what options there might be. Some of that might have been moving them into a formal HR process if that was something that they wanted. Sometimes it was to help them to speak to a line manager. Sometimes it was just to record their... Um, their recollections of the culture of the organisation. So there were many um, different um, different ways in which I would have supported somebody. There wasn't um, a particular route. Yeah, I understand that. Um, in terms of the options that they might have been looked at, we know mediation was, was raised, and whether that's appropriate or not in, in these kind of ventures mm -hmm. is a, another question, um, dubious. Um, but was that an option that you knew could possibly was offered and that's something if they wanted it, it could be considered and was the option of um, them going to the police something also raised with them so um i think i'll i would constrain my comments here to to miss a because i think that's really the subject matter of the committee's consideration um, in relation to um the the, the complaints so um Clearly, um, I, I do, in terms of the statement I took from Miss A when I spoke to her on the um, 22nd of November, she raised a series of very significant issues with me. And um, 
uh, I um, obviously um, found um, what she said to me um, profoundly difficult, actually, so I'd just be honest about that. And um, in, in response, response to that, we did discuss um, some of the things and issues that she, she may want to think about in, in taking matters forward. Um, I don't want to go into too much detail, but you've asked specifically about um, the police. I think at the time I did record that I thought that um, um, it could raise um, it, it could potentially raise matters of a criminal nature. I did record that at the time. Can and, I ask you um, the reaction to that? Was it, well, oh, that's a, a step too far? Well, or, well I, I think at the time, um, she, she had only just um, come and spoken to me. Um, it was not, an, as you can imagine, a very easy um, meeting. And um, obviously, I just wanted to be compassionate and thoughtful um, about um, what she would want. and. Um, I think, you know, um, I've said in the introduction, as um, somebody who'd worked in the justice system for a long time, I was very mindful of the need to, to, to be very careful around somebody that had revealed something of that nature to you and the kind of considerations that you would need to take. So, you know, it was not a decision point. Um, we agreed um, on the back of... Um, the discussion that would be appropriate for for the for, for me to put a note of um, that meeting to um, uh, HR anonymously on her behalf, and um, I, I gave HR um, a, a relatively detailed note of the issues that she had raised with me and the discussion that we had had. So HR um, had that at that point on an anonymised basis um, because that was her wish. And it was the meeting that I've just, I've, you mentioned Barbara Allison. Barbara Allison attended at that meeting as well, um, and um, and she and she and uh, and Missy had um, considered the note of the meeting, and and um, that me that an anonymised note went forward to HR. Right. If I could ask you, what was she, uh, your understanding of your role in relation to the the police? Were yeah. you to contact the police in the yeah. event of a concern? Raised. So, so, um, so I'd asked at the outset um, on taking on the on to, after being asked to take on the role by um, the permanent secretary, I'd asked for some specification um, about the nature of the role and what that might entail, and actually also what what I might do in terms of of people that might come to me. So that specification was given, and the committee will get that detail um, in due course. Um, and I also asked separately for a checklist um, because I was concerned that um, people might come to me in, in distress, they, they, they could come to me with significant um, live issues that they were facing, and it would be important for me to have some um, framing for any conversation, and that checklist, I think, um, can be made available, will be made available to the committee as well. So um, in that context, um, it was just important for me to, to uh, engage carefully um, with that individual. So you're able to set out um, what the process would be for taking a matter to the police. Were you clear about so, that? So um, I'd asked at that point in time about a police liaison officer generally. So just to be clear, um, I, my role was in relation to current and historic issues. It was not particularly in relation to ministers. It was any staff who had come forward with any issues. And um, so, so I had to be mindful that staff, current staff could be facing current difficult issues and I might need to intervene okay so I'd asked if there was a police liaison officer that that could that could be could be made available would be known so there was an opportunity if an individual came to me and said this is what's happening to me we talked it through it was significant I thought it raised matters of a criminal nature they wanted to go and speak to the police about it of course I would have supported them to do that I have a lot of confidence in our police and their ability to engage around issues of um, of sexual crime uh, I think they, they have they have a, a very very high service there um, so, so that was one option that could have been taken separately um, if, if somebody didn't want to do that that was fine because they didn't want to but I wanted to understand what the obligation might be on me as a senior civil servant who had that information 
or what information, what, what obligation there might be on, on the organisation. And I think in the information that you will get, there is some reference to me um, asking that of um, Judith McKinnon and um, on advice um, on that matter, um, I was advised that um, there would be HR involvement and there would want to be further discussion and consideration around that. So as far as I was concerned, um, advice had been given to me and it was quite clear. And I think subsequently the PEMSEC's written to say a bit more about that um, generally. So I suppose just um, for your reassurance, I, I was very alive to that issue, but also very mindful and thoughtful about the need to, to be supportive of the person that was that had chosen to speak to me. And and you didn't have anything to do with the genetic meeting that you know happened with the police the liaising often. No. So you know explaining no. anything. Finally, no. um, if I could um convener, were you involved in the discussions on the referral to the police? No. No, so not at all. No. Okay. Were you aware of which um, of officials were involved? No. Um, I um, I did um, provide to Judith McKinnon um, the public protection um, names of people that I thought, because of, of our role um, advising, working with um, the police generally on policy-related issues, I would have known the, the part of Police Scotland that would have public protection specialism. So that name was given to Judith McKinnon. I've looked at the documentation, the name is redacted, and I've been advised um, that that's because there isn't considered to be a need to release that name. So I, I do know the name, but I'm not going to give it no, um, for that, that reason, that's if fine. that's okay. Can I just ask then how you did become become aware there was a referral and who told you? So, um, I didn't know that until it became public knowledge um, in um, August 2018. Um, that was the first I knew that the matter did you had read it got in the to press, that point. Or? Pardon? Did you read it in the I press? I heard it in the press, that's correct. Yeah. Thank you, that's very helpful. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Andy Whiteman. Thank you, convener. <clears throat> Good morning, Ms. Russell. I have to leave at 20 past 12, so it's no disrespect to have a meeting with the Cabinet Secretary. Um, you took on the role of confidant role um, as requested by the permanent secretary. Um, were you aware at the time you were asked to take on that role <clears throat> that there was a, a review underway of how um, complaints regarding sexual harassment would be handled by the Scottish Government? So at the point in time I took on the role, no. I, I wasn't aware of any of that and I hadn't been involved in any of that. Um, I think the record will show, and again, sorry, you don't have the documentation, but Judith McKinnon did share, for reference, a copy of draft guidance, um, the draft guidance on the 24th of November. Um, and that was the first I would have been aware of that. And did, did that have any bearing on the confidant role that you were undertaking, or would no. it... I mean, the confidant role was in relation to all staff. And it just so happened that some staff that came to speak to me happened to come to speak to me about matters in relation to the former First Minister. You say some staff. Were there more than one or how many? I, 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 don't, I, won't, I won't go into any more detail if you don't mind, but it's fair to say there was more than one person, yeah. OK, that's fine. Um, so once the complaint had been formally received by the Scottish Government in January in relationship to Ms A, what, what was your role? Did it just continue to be a confidant? Yes. And did you have quite significant engagement with Ms A during that no. process? No. As I said to, to Ms Mitchell, I didn't have any engagement with Ms A at all. She didn't choose to come back to speak to me further. After the 22nd After of... the 29th of November, when I had the email exchange with her and she agreed that she would speak um, to HR and I removed her anonymity at that point um, for HR um, because she'd agreed to speak to them. And um, I said, you know, I'm here if you want anything, but she chose not to get back in touch. So your actual engagement with Ms A was over a relatively short period of Correct. a week to 10 days yeah. or so? Correct. Um, <clears throat> if I can just turn to um, the investigation that was underway, were you 
told that that was underway or not? So the, I wouldn't have known anything other than I think there is a reference um, in documents I've seen in January or February to, to a discussion between Nikki Richards and Judith McKinnon suggesting that out of courtesy they might want to tell me that these things had moved into a formal process. Now, I can't recollect whether I was told that, and certainly I didn't know anything at all about anything post the 29th of November. At most, uh, they must have said, they could have said to me that there was, there was now a formal process, but that is the limit of what I would have known. I didn't know anything further. And were you satisfied in relationship to the advice you were given um, about record keeping, for example, what your duties were in relationship to the things that people divulged to you, how, to what extent you should maintain a, a permanent note of that. Were you, were you, were you satisfied that you, you had sufficient guidance on that question? So I think it's, it is an interesting point because obviously people were coming to me in a quasi-independent role with a certain um, expectation that I would hold things in confidence and it was to be an informal private space. But at the end of the day, I still was a senior civil servant, so there were still obligations on me as a senior civil servant. So I did keep notes and um, would have disposed of them um, as appropriate. Um, in relation to the individual matters that I was dealing with. Some notes I obviously have had to keep, yeah. And in relationship to your role as confidant, was it clear to people who came to you that um, they would have the final say in what, if anything, you did or to whom you may speak about their yeah. matters? I tried as far as possible to do that, which explains why when Miss A spoke to me initially, I put her the note I'd taken of the meeting on an anonymized basis and kept um, her, 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 her um, identity separate. Um, I think, um, given what I've said already, and it was an issue I'd raised initially with both Nikki Richards and Judith McKinnon, given our obligations as an employer, and bearing in mind that people were raising issues that happened within the workplace, inevitably, if significant issues were raised with me that might have required us as an organisation to respond, notwithstanding the duty of confidentiality, there may have been circumstances where I would have found that difficult to have not had taken some action. I mean, clearly, I would have done all of that with the individual and I would have spoken them through that but I think there were boundaries to this sense that I could just keep everything completely confidential there would have been boundaries and just finally to confirm you talk about anonymity did Ms A reveal who she was to you when she came or did you insist that that shouldn't be uh, the case I met with Miss A in person but she was clear initially that she wanted to, to give an anonymised account, which is what I facilitated. And that was an anonymised account to you? Well, it wouldn't be anonymised to you. What, what was the... What was the, what was the it was anonymised so that it wasn't... Um, it wasn't it was, she wasn't named in the account, and some, some details were taken out of the account um, to try, to, try, try to, to disguise her identity. And when you say account, that's an account you were keeping contemporaneously with your discussions with her? It, it, it was a detailed note of the set of issues that she described to me of her experience in our organisation. And just finally, sorry, um, that note, did you then pass that on once the formal complaint was um, so made? So the note or? was... Pa so I, I met her on Wednesday the 22nd, I think, in the afternoon. And given the seriousness of the issues that she raised with me, I produced the note and sent it to HR at 6.35 that evening. And, and she, she, she was content with that her, you... Yes, with her because consent. She, had, she had seen the draft and she was content with the draft and it was sent that evening. OK, thanks very much Thank indeed. Thank you. Thanks, convener. Okay, Alistair Allen. Thank you, convener. Um, earlier on, um, Judith McKinnon... Uh, mentioned how you had appointed her as investigating officer. Uh, can I ask uh, if you can say any more about how that appointment was made? Who else was in? 
involved in any of that at all. You weren't? I, I didn't have any involvement after the 29th of November. OK, I beg your pardon. In that case, can I ask, in terms of your own involvement, uh, whether you reported to the Permanent Secretary? So, um, I spoke to the Permanent Secretary and she asked me to take on the role on the 10th of November. She made it clear that um, if I was to engage further about the role, I should do that with Nikki Richards and with um, Judith McKinnon. So um, I um, duly reported, and I think the agreement was that um, I, I would initially um, review with Nikki and Judith issues that came to me on a weekly basis as appropriate. So um, obviously, once the announcement had been made to the organisation on the, on the 13th of November, there were a few things that came to me. And um, I engaged um, as appropriate with um, Nikki and, and Judith um, in, in that time frame. I am aware that, um, that Nikki um, gave a high level, and I think this will be in the documentation that, that you get, uh, note to the Permanent Secretary that reflected that both myself and Barbara Allison had received um, a, um, a concern in relation to a former minister. And that, I think, note went to her on the 23rd of November. Um, and um, I didn't actually speak direct to the PERMSEC um, about any of the matters I dealt with. Everything I did was through uh, Judith and Nikki. Thank you. Um, you've described the, the role of uh, confidant, I beg your pardon, earlier was referred to as investigating officer by slip of the tongue. Um, but you, you referred to that role. Um, did you feel that the way that that role was formulated uh, left it sufficiently independent to, to, to be useful? Yeah. So um, I'm quite an independent-minded person, and I had been given that authority by the Permanent Secretary. So I did, as far as I could, um, carry out that role in an independent way. But I was mindful that it was no, I was not independent. I was a senior civil servant. And I did um, raise that issue with uh, Nikki on the 29th of November, some early reflections on the role, and I think you'll get this in your documentation as well, that one of the issues I did have in my mind was whether the role was really sufficiently independent and whether it would be a, a, something to be considered about having a truly independent role rather than somebody that was a senior civil servant doing the role. So that was certainly one of my reflections um, in relation to, to the role. You, you mentioned also uh, the, the boundaries, as you saw them, around issues of, of confidence. Uh, and can I ask if you can see whether you felt those boundaries were effective, whether they allowed you to do your job, uh, what you consider those boundaries to be? Yeah, so um, I think it was really important for me to understand what an individual wanted and that required me really to meet, engage and discuss issues with whoever the indiv individual was that came to speak to me. So it's an important role, I think, in listening and trying to seek to understand what that individual wanted and then to, to talk them through what, what sorts of things might be a good next step for them, what, what, what could help them uh, where they currently are, what might make a difference. Um, and that was really the way in which I would have approached anybody that, that came to speak to me. And, you know, regardless of the, the, the circumstance, I treated each person with um, the same level of seriousness because I thought that it was a big step for somebody to take to uh, approach really a stranger that they, they had um, they had found their, their, their um, text number on a staff message. So I did take... Um, every person who came to speak to me um, seriously. And some of them would um, have had, had concerns, for example, about their line management or whether they had confidence in the HR processes. So some of that was about just helping and talking people through things. Other times people just really wanted somebody just to, to offload about something, to, to talk an issue through. Sometimes I might suggest people would speak to the trade unions, signpost them to the employee assistance programme, suggest that they might need some counselling. I mean, there was a lot of different um, 
there was a lot of different options, I think, open to people once, once we started discussing things through. But as I've said already, um, I, I always recognise in the role there may be things that were referred to me or, or um, revealed to me that were, were, were of significance, bearing in mind that we are a, the employer in, in the organisation, that I would have to do something um, more with that. I would say in all of the people I dealt with, that every step that I took was with, with people's consent and um, broadly um, with, with, with I did things at a pace that people felt comfortable with. I don't know if that's helpful. Well, it is. I mean, finally, can I ask, you, you, you alluded to the, the issue of, of independence there earlier on and, and the, the need for it. I mean, one of the things we're doing as a committee is, is attempting to find lessons that can be yeah. learned for the future. Uh, do I take it from your earlier answer that you you feel that a lesson we should learn is around the issue of whether some of the role that you were undertaking should have been undertaken more independently? Well, I wasn't truly independent, was I? I was still a senior civil servant, so I think that's something certainly for the committee to consider, and I thought perhaps something that, that Laura Dunlop QC might consider as well as part of, of the review that she's currently um, undertaking. Thank you, convener. Angela Constance. Thanks very much, uh, convener, and uh, good afternoon, Ms. Ms. Russell. Um, given that the role of investigating officer and the confidant is entirely separate, I wondered if, therefore, there is any merit in only one person having conversations with a potential complainant before a complaints process starts. And I, I, I wonder, and I appreciate you're not here to give a, a, a personal view, but I, I wondered if, if, if that issue um, of process was considered by the organisation at all. So I suppose I would have viewed the role of confidant as separate, really, because um, people were coming to me as set out in an informal, supportive, private space. There was no expectation at that point that those people would ever go into a formal process or necessarily even go to HR. So, so I suppose the point is, it's that you know you've got to understand if people come to speak to me, it's perhaps because they don't have confidence in the more formal parts of the organisation or they've lost faith. So there was something for me about that, that opportunity of a safe space for people to step into where they felt that they could be listened to and they would have a, a person who didn't have, um, didn't have any formal attachment to HR in that sense that they could talk things through with that person. And I suppose that's why I also thought it was important because often trade unions can play that sort of role. And I had um, at the outset said I wanted it made clear in the staff notice that the, um, yeah, I wanted the trade unions to know about the role and to be happy with the role, but also that the staff notice would be clear that I was only one of a number, number of routes that staff could go, go down if they had issues around sexual harassment. Yeah. And I, I, I appreciate that it is entirely separate, the role of the confidant, but bearing in mind there are different routes that people can pursue it is therefore you know possible for people to be pursuing different routes at the same time mm -hmm. or in parallel mm -hmm. and therefore i wondered if that added to the case for the need for the confidant to be external to the organization i um yeah. I mean, for the reasons I've already given, I think it's worth considering um, the nature of the independence of the confidant role and how compatible it is ultimately with some of the, the, the um, duties that might be upon you as a, as a senior civil servant in the organisation. Yeah. Okay, thank, thank you very much. Thank you, Camino. Alex Colhampton. Thank you very much, uh, Camino. I only have a, a couple of questions. Um, thank you for coming to see us today, Ms Russell. Um, I'm very interested to know, to your knowledge, um, who, who in the civil service had first contact 
with the complainers about their complaints. I'm not talking about, uh, notwithstanding the fact that in one case we understand that there was a, an informal process contemporaneous with the actual events themselves, but in 2017, mm -hmm. who was the civil servant with whom the complainer or complainers had first contact and made their first disclosure? So I had no contact at all with Miss B, so I have never had any engagement with Miss B, so just to make that clear. In relation to Miss A, clearly she had, um, and I can see from the documentation, been asking to speak to somebody about the concerns that she had or her experience. As far as I'm aware, I'm the first person that she um, spoke about her experience in total with. Okay, and thank you for that. And roughly on what date, I mean, or, or you don't have to give an exact date for jigsaw identification purposes. It's fine. I mean, I okay. think I've said already it was the 22nd of November that the I spoke to her November. at length. Yeah. Okay. So we now understand from uh, documents that came with the Commission of Diligence in the Judicial Review that, in fact, the First Minister's private secretary uh, mm -hmm. met with complainer Miss A on the 20th and the 21st mm -hmm. of November and that she may have made a disclosure to him about the complaints that she wished to make. So that would make him first contact. Is that your So I, I, I am aware of that, but that's not something that she spoke to me about and it's not something I've ever spoken to him about. So your knowledge of John Summers' involvement in I this... didn't have any knowledge of his involvement until I saw in the paperwork. Right. Okay, that's fine. Um, thank you for that. I think on, uh, I'll move on to a different topic and, and that will be me. This is my final question then. So you, you said in your opening remarks that you retain this role, the Confidential yes. Signing Board. Um, has anyone approached you about the conduct of former ministers since the collapse of the Judicial Review? So... Um, I've said I've retained the role. I don't think the role's really been promoted in the organisation since August 2018. So in August 2018, it was promoted um, uh, as, as um, uh, in light of that, I, can't, I, I do have the staff message here. So some people came forward um, to me um, in August 2018, that short period after that. Since then, um, a couple of people have come forward on very different issues um, in relation to ministers. Um, the, as I say, August 2018, clearly because of the focus around that, of um, the matter being referred to, to the police, etc. I did have some people come, come to speak to me at that point in time. I understand. And, and do you think that the fact that the procedure for the handling of complaints against former ministers uh, remains in place in an unamended form and potentially exposed to the same kind of legal challenge um, as the former first minister mounted, do you think that might act as an impediment or inhibiting factor to anyone coming forward subsequently? I don't, I don't actually have a view, view, view on that. Um, I, I would hope that... Um, people would have known that um, the role was available and that I was a trustworthy person, they could still come and speak to me. Okay, thank you. No further questions for me. Jackie Bailey. Thank you very much, convener, and good afternoon, Ms. Russell. Um, it, you used to be, I think you told us, the is it the Director of Safer Communities from June 2015, which put you in charge of the police? Correct. Excellent. Um, Judith McKinnon was the head of HR governance at the Scottish Police Authority from 2015. Correct. So you would have known each other reasonably well in no. the course of your everyday work. I didn't know Judith well. I knew, I knew Judith. Um, I can um, say I knew Judith um, because I'd had one particular engagement with Judith in relation to, um, I think it was a recruitment round for the Deputy Chief Constables. I think it was a recruitment round that, that Will Kerr was um, appointed a deputy chief constable and she was involved in that recruitment round and um, I happened to be involved in that recruitment round um, in a very limited way and that was my main engagement with Judith McKinnon. Other than that I would have known that she worked for Police Scotland but I didn't have regular engagement okay. with her. That, that's very helpful to know just the, the context. Um, now 
it, you said you weren't the one who reported the matter to the police, but in terms of questioning, um, you indicated that um, you would provide contact with the police of the complaints if it was appropriate to do so. Can I ask you on how many occasions you've actually done that? So I haven't had to do that. Not at all? No. Okay. Um, were the police aware of the complaint from Miss A? Um, you didn't provide them with any contact about what she said? That would have been completely inappropriate. Okay. Um, do you know who did? Um, no, I don't. You don't? But somebody clearly in the organisation would have contacted the police on her behalf? I, I wasn't involved in any of that part of the process, so um, I, I, don't, I don't know that. Okay, that's fine, thank you. Um, the Chief Superintendent, who was the Head of Public protection um, was named in the courts. That was Detective Chief Superintendent Leslie Bull. She was the one who told the court that Leslie Evans had offered the full investigation officer's report. Um, her name is obviously in the public domain because she testified in court. Um, is that the point of contact you had within the police? So I am, I, I've been advised that um, the name has been redacted for a reason, so I, I'm not going to say anything further about that. Okay. More generally, I can say, obviously, that I would know Leslie Bowles. Um, she was highly thought of. She had a very strong role in relation to public protection. So I did know um, Leslie Bowles. I would have met her in my professional role as Director for Safer Communities. Sure. OK. Um, um, the reason I'm curious is to try and identify when the police first knew about um, the allegations that, that were made. So you appreciate why I'm asking the question. Um, did Miss A tell you about the informal resolution arrived at by the former First Minister's office in December 2013? I'm, 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 I don't have the statement that she gave me in, 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 in front of me. Um, I, I, was, I was aware in detail of the circumstances, I think it's fair to say. Did, did you put that um, informal resolution in December 2013 into the alleged um, it, assault of Miss A um, in the anonymised memo which you then sent to Miss McKinnon? The note was detailed. I don't oh, think I detailed. should go into any more. Okay. Anymore. I, it was um, a detailed note of her experiences in the organisation. I okay. think that's sufficient. That, that, that's very helpful. I'm not pressing you for detail at all. I'm just trying to follow the chain of events and who knew what when. Um, so there is the potential on the back of that informal note for the police certainly to have knowledge of the allegations about the former First Minister since late December 2017. My note was a detailed note of okay. what she explained to me, a okay. detailed note. Thank you. I take, I take the okay. point you're making to me, absolutely. Um, in terms of that note, you obviously shared it with Judith McKinnon. Did you share it with um, Miss Richards or Miss Evans? So um, the note was sent um, for your eyes only on the 22nd of November to Judith McKinnon and to Nicola Richards. The other people that had the note was Miss A and Barbara okay. Allison. Okay, thank you. Um, when you shared the note with Judith McKinnon, were you aware that she was going to be appointed investigating officer? No. No. Um, when you found out that she was appointed um, investigating officer, did you think to raise a question about um, the difficulty it, inherent in her prior knowledge of um, the complainants and indeed the policy as you understood it? So. Um I don't think I would have been necessarily aware that she had been appointed as investigating officer in any event. Even if I had, I understood that they were taking full advice. So I would have expected them to have got full advice on that matter. OK. Um, did you, given your legal background, see a problem? I mean, I appreciate you saying they had other people to take advice from, but I'm asking whether you saw a problem. I wasn't aware and I wouldn't have had a view. Um, okay. I, I wouldn't have thought it would have been um, appropriate for me to have a view on that. Okay. Um, Mr Cole Hamilton asked you about the meeting with the um, First Minister's Principal Private Secretary that you didn't know about. Um, is it conceivable that um, Miss A was referred by John Summers to seek you out? 
I don't think that would matter. I mean, the, the, the note had gone out to the whole organisation. What did it matter how, how she decided to come and speak to me? It wasn't I, relevant. I guess it's of interest to the committee. And you said yourself that um, your role subsequently hasn't been well advertised, but she had herself been trying to speak to you and clearly didn't know who you were in the organisation. So I'm just wondering if, if um, quite properly, she was rooted in your direction and referred I, by... I, I don't know. She never said. Know. She just asked, okay. texted me and said, could I come and meet you? And I said, yes. Fine. Thank you very much. I don't think there's... Oh, Alex Cole Hamilton. Yeah, Alex Cole Hamilton. Just thank you for bringing me back in, convener. Just two very quick follow-ups. Um, just a very quick one following your very last question uh, answer to Jackie Bailey there. Um, she texted you um, asking to come see you. On what date did you receive that text? So, I don't have that text. Um, she would have texted me after the 13th of um, November. Um, the phone that I had, and I did explain this um, at the time, uh, was, um, was defunct in the summer of 2018, so I had a Blackberry, it broke, I got an iPhone in replacement, um, the texts that had been on that Blackberry were, were not kept. But it was in the period from the 13th of November, I have my calendar um, from the 22nd of November, so I know that um, it was the afternoon of the 22nd of November that was blocked out. Uh, I think uh, I would have tried to, sp I, I tried to, anyone that contacted me, I tried to arrange to meet them as quickly as possible um, at their convenience, and I think that was the first um, date that suited her. So she, she would have approached me between the 13th of November and me meeting her on the 22nd. But it's unlikely to have been the exact day before. So uh, what I'm driving at here is that um, I, I think it's very interesting that she would have perhaps reached out to you a few days before that meeting on the 22nd and independently had a separate meeting with John Summers as the First Minister's private secretary, rather than him being the conduit of referral saying, well, there's a signing board, you can text Gillian Russell. So she'd obviously reached out to Barbara Allison because mm -hmm. Barbara Allison had spoken to me. So clearly she was looking to see who she could speak to. And, you know, you've got to remember in the context of the Me Too movement, people had a different perception and it was a very difficult time for, for women who had been subjected to, to previous behaviour. So, you know, it's, it's perhaps not surprising in the context of, of, of what was going on more widely that people were looking to, to share the, 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 the circumstances that they'd found themselves in. No, I understand that. No, I appreciate that and, and, and fully accept that. Um, OK, completely unrelated, uh, follow up to my earlier line of questioning. Um, and, and forgive me, I may have misheard you here, so uh, correct me if I'm wrong. But um, you, you said in my uh, your answer to my earlier question that um, the last time that you'd been using your confidential sounding board um, in respect to former ministers was when the news broke of the investigations, the government investigations. You said that other people had approached you yeah. at that point. Was that about the behaviour of the former First Minister? Yes. And uh, were any of those taken forward? So, um, at that point in time, uh, I was quite clear that, um, given that there was now going to be a police investigation, that it wouldn't be appropriate for me to hear the substance of any issues that people wanted to raise. And instead, um, if people did approach me, obviously concerned, worried, they might want to, to, to speak, speak up, um, that at that point, um, the most appropriate thing to do would be to offer them, uh, there was a, there was a, a number that the, the, the police had provided, um, to provide them with that number and just to provide them with reassurance that um, you know, the organisation was, was supportive and the police would be supportive. So, th so, so that was the extent of my involvement at that point. So is it fair to say that when the news broke um, and everything that came with that, um, that effectively the government abandoned the use of the procedure for the handling of harassment complaints in, in respect of the complaints regarding the former First Minister and everyone who had a concern was directly referred to the police rather than starting a new process within the government? So, clearly, um, the fact that there was then a criminal investigation, that would take precedence over other things. 
So I don't know what decisions or discussions there were in government, but if people came to me specifically about issues in relation to the former First Minister, at that point, I would have viewed that as something that should be dealt with through the, 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 the ongoing police investigation, and that would be for, for people to consider how they wanted to do that. Clearly, if people came to me about issues that were nothing to do with that, I would have continued in my role as I did do from time to time. Okay. Does that answer your question? It does, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Margaret Mitchell. Just a, a couple of points of, of clarification. You said that Barbara uh, Allison had indicated to you that somebody would want to um, come forward and uh, engage with you in your confidant role. Can you remember what date Barbara Allison told you that? So, so this is where, um, as I say, it was after the, the 13th and before the 22nd, because it was Miss A that she did mention to me, wanted to come and speak yeah. to me. So it would have been in that short window between the... It would have been probably towards the end of the week, but I can't be certain, which is why I'm frustrated I don't have the text, because if I had yeah. the text with Miss A, I would have been able to tell you exactly, but it was towards the end of the week of the, the 13th and perhaps a, a, I, I couldn't say more than that to be honest it would, would be unfair I couldn't but say wasn't more maybe within the first couple of days of your appointment you might have remembered that more and more towards the, the few so, 13th, so I was appointed was on the 13th yeah um, and um, Barbara would have spoken to me after that and as I say the meeting took place on the 22nd okay um, and could you just clarify, you said that um, from August 2018, the role or your role really hadn't been, hasn't been promoted. Mm -hmm. um, is it fair to say the Permanent Secretary promoted it initially with her email? And, yeah. Yeah. And it would have been her 